Dan Brami, welcome to Dark Mode. This is a really exciting episode. Now, Dan is the co-founder and CEO at Cybra and his profile list, which I'm really excited for. I think it's quite fun. It says disinformation fighter, pastor lover, undercover geek. I hope that is in priority order and you're taking all things fake news, enhancing media literacy online to task. So welcome to Dark Mode. It's great to have you with us, Dan. Thank you so much. I'm super, super happy to be here. Thank you for having me, really. Amazing. Hey, Dan, give us a bit of background on, on who you are and the business you run currently, because I think that will set a scene for the rest of the information we discuss in the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a 32 years old French guy that is married to an Argentinian lady, got two baby dragons at home. Uh, from a professional standpoint, I have a background in sales. I've worked at Google, Deloitte, and then I was the first employee of another startup. And then at some point, I met my co-founder, Yosef, who's my beloved partner at Chrome and and chief product officer. He's the mad scientist, really. So, so, you know, I'm always happy to have him as a friend, not as an unfriend, let's go that way. Uh, we have three co-founders. Luckily enough, I found the two people on the planet that had the audacity and the knowledge to be able to say that they were part of the, of the, uh, part of the commanders of the, the information warfare within the Israeli army. And so at some point, and after a really long military service, you know, they, they felt that they had to do something about it. And it's always like that. When you serve for a really long time, sometimes you sort of recalculate your priorities and, your, and yourself as what's important to me as, an, as a human being. And they said, we've seen so much of these online snowballs, of the dissemination and the spread of, of content for better or for worse. We would like to, and that's how we sort of pitch it out of the idea, you know, four and a half years ago, we want to build a filtering mechanism. That was the first idea, right? And so that's how everything started. And, you know, since then we've, we've grown to being close to 50 employees. We've got offices in, in, in the U.S., Texas, and New York, and we have offices in Israel, which is more of the, the research and development part of the company. We've raised, it hasn't been fully enough, but we've raised a little more than 10 million so far. And we've got incredible investors all the way from Founders Fund to the Tel Aviv University VC Fund and, and Accomplice and, and absolutely fantastic super angels. And we're just super happy, you know, we've been fortunate to be able to solve a problem that is, um, on the one hand, one of the most important problems that I can currently see in our world. And on the other hand, it's a really tough nut to crack. Really, really. Technologically speaking, it's difficult. And even from an, from an ideology standpoint, because there's always, when you talk about the truth and media literacy, you talk about subjectivity and object a lot of the time. Because for me, your background might be purple, but maybe for gay, your background might be pink. So then the question is, Who's right? Who's wrong? And who am I or who are you to judge? These are all the questions that we are encountering as a company. Full-blown automated AI company on a daily basis. So anyway, I love my job. You can see this. And, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about super important topics. So really. I love it, Dan, when you talk about solving the world's biggest problems. And, a, and in particular, using technology to solve the world's biggest problems. So very, very interesting. You're on the right podcast, Dan. <laughs> hey, Dan, you mentioned uh, media literacy there. I just want to hone in on that. Can you explain a bit more about what media literacy is, how we can better educate the general public on thinking critically about what is consumed online as a star state? Yeah. But I think that, you know, for the last four and a half years of existence as a company, and even as an individual, as part of Sarah, the toughest job that we've had was to make people understand. It's the realization. It's the realization that the threat of disinformation, fake news, and malicious spreading, or as the chat GPT folks are dividing the world between actors, behaviors, and content, which I actually I love this. It's the realization that everything that is being said can affect everyone. Uh, and of course, I'm not saying this because mm -hmm make people afraid of the world and not say anything online. But I just want, I just want to point out the fact that when you are hesitating whether you should buy a certain type of brand of cereal, or whether you should buy a certain type of car, or whether you should vote for candidate number A, uh, number one, candidate number two, 
it, it's the, the misconception, and this is funny, that crazy misconception that the problem we're trying to solve is actually only related to politics or even geopolitical storms. It's wrong, but it's almost everywhere, right? That the one thing that I want people to maybe take away from this whole episode and this whole conversation, it's that being effective. Every time you are writing something online or you're being exposed to a certain type of content, then you eventually, when it is publicly available, you eventually can potentially become a target to a bad or fake actor that is trying to skew with the public opinion, that is trying to draw you into a, uh, we, sometimes we call it a contextualized trap, right? Which is, oh, I saw Ben, I saw that you like that kind of core. Now, let me show you something that might make you change your mind based on a semi-truth and based on the fact that I, I may know that you were inclined, you, you were inclined to you know, get to point A instead of point B. There's a lot of things that you can do in terms of changing the perception of other people's opinion. And that to me is the realization. We, we, we ought to be better at helping people understand that this is, this is in almost everything we touch and almost every type of conversation that we're encountering on social media, on traditional media, and even sometimes in instant messaging platforms, which are usually the closest that you have in your phones, right? Yeah, we could go down a big rabbit hole here just on the smartphones and even dumb dumb phones. There's something we're Talk prepping. Talk about me again? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just talking about digital nomadism and those sort of things. But I really enjoyed what you said there, Dan, as well, because apart from the geopolitical effects of misinformation, disinformation, and being ex-military between Ben and I too, we very much understand the information warfare realm. And that's a really, really prominent part of, in particular, cybersecurity, but really empowering the general public on thinking critically about what they consume online. How do we actually bring media literacy to the general population and really empower them to think about what they see and go to good sources of information? I think that is absolutely a, a really key threat and risk and really paramount in solving in the modern era. Absolutely. Yep. Dan, I'm not too sure if you had a chance to to take a look at the Eurasia Group report. It's more regionalized at the moment. It, a top three risk this year is outlined, and you'll love this. You'll find it intriguing as weapons of mass disruption. And I'll go on a bit of a tangent here to say that it notes algorithms and social media platforms rip the fabric of civil society while maximizing profits. And this creates unprecedented political division, disruption, and dysfunction, and not only, again, at that level, but in, in wider society. So that, to me, is a really interesting and poignant point of the report for the year ahead. But I'd certainly see the mission that you're on is in combating that. So how do you see weapons of mass disruption unfolding in the year ahead? <laughs> this is such an accurate term. Um, all right. So first of all, you shall not see surprise. There's no surprise. Unfortunate. Unfortunate, <laughs> no surprise. It's not surprising that it's considered to be among the biggest risks. Uh, and because also for the previous question, weapons of mass disruption. I mean, this is true. Let me tell you why. If we go back to the model that we spoke of, even for chat GPT, which I think sort of simplifies the way that those so-called online snowballs or disinformation threats are happening. You've got the actors and the behaviors and the content here for a second. The actors are, the, uh, let's call it the source. These are the, the identities where things are happening. The behaviors are the techniques and the methodologies in which that, that they are employing for the sake of spreading disseminating and automating certain behaviors to, to become more plausible and trustworthy to the eyes of other people. And then content. Content is a content. Content can be text. Content can be pictures and videos. And content can be on. If you think about this whole map that I've just shown you right now, right, the actors, the behaviors, and the content, almost 100% of that whole map 
can be automated through AI. Let's go from the end, right? Because it's fresh in our head. Content. What about text? Newsflash. As of two, three weeks ago, you can generate content at scale, really high speed, huge amounts of volume that are written, crafted in a very powerful manner. What about videos and pictures? I think I don't have to tell everyone. If anyone has ever heard of the word deepfake and GANs, generative adversarial networks, you know that today you have a lot of different engines where you can click on a button. Literally, you click on a button on the website and that generates pictures of people that are more realistic that you can think of. If I put my mom across 10 of these pictures, nine out of 10 times, she will fall into that trap. For sure, right? Now, I don't have to explain why behaviors can be automated because it, it's, it's been out there since social media. Since social media has existed, there are softwares that were, by the way, created. They were created for a good purpose and they still are for good purpose, right? You have a lot of software that allows to reschedule content dissemination for brands. But, and there's a but, it was crazy. You can also use it for the, for the flip side of the story, which is if I can disseminate content as a brand and pre-schedule my content to make it more efficient to reach the right audience, and as a bad actor, or even, even as a malicious competitor that holds a grudge against my other, you know, food and beverage company out there that is shrinking my market size, um, you can do a lot of bad things. And then last but not least, and I'm sorry I went from the end to the beginning, last but not least, actors. Do I have to explain to anyone why, for example, just a quick analogy, and this is not, this is not me bragging, this is me explaining, why were we involved in the deal between Musk and Twitter? Because the problem of spam and bot accounts was massively bigger massively more important than what the platform claimed to be. I'm not saying Twitter has done it on purpose or not, but I can tell you for sure that their methodologies was not incentivizing the meticulousness and, the, and, and a thorough examination of the process of understanding between the real bad take of actors. The process was incentivizing speed. And I yeah. have a problem with yeah, absolutely. So Cyabra was involved in analyzing the bots and, and the behaviors, the actors in the Twitter deal. Dan, would you like to give us a bit of an insight, a look into what that entailed? Yeah, yeah. Finally, I can talk about it. You know, before that, I would have been sued by 12 million people probably. <laughs> uh, now we're good. So we, at the end of the day, our dream was actually to do what we did with Elon Musk, we actually wanted to do it internal with Plant because the platform is the source. This is the matrix. We wanted to go into the matrix and press the weird buttons and then say, wow, we found the pitfalls. Now you can go with your CISO, CIO, and CFO of an architect of Twitter. Now you can go and pull the trigger and do, your, do a good thing about it. Problem is, Twitter was less happy about partnering with us at first. So we had to go through must. So instead of going with the acquiree, we went with the acquirer. The effect was the same because eventually we did what we are supposed to do as a company, which is to go back to the beginning of the conversation, which is to filter. And we did. And we filtered massive amounts of information that was provided by the platform itself. And the results will work because it's not the single digit, it's the low you know, two digits. And it sounds weird when I call it like that, but it's between three to five X higher than what the platform claims at any wow. given time. Wow. And, and for the people that might listen to this conversation later on, right, it might sound like, you know, what, what's the big deal? What's the discrepancy between, let's say, 3% spam and bot accounts and between 11 and 
Forget about the ratio, about the multiple between some question. It's the ripples effect. Remember, there's actors, there's behaviors, and there's content. If we look at the B, the B, the behavior, the, the spreading mechanism, it is so strong and so powerful on Twitter, for better and for worse. But right now we were talking about the worst in that case. You cannot imagine the ripples effect that the 11 to 14% can create as part of the bigger pie of 100% of the conversation. This is very worrying. And no, it's not only about geopolitical repercussions. It's about a lot of the discussions out there. Totally. So, what, so what was it, Dan? Were you filtering the actual content that was being proliferated on Twitter by bots specifically, or was it a bit broader in scope in terms of the our job was to, No, our job was to look at a specific specific um, data set of information that yep. we have received. And then it was really twofold. A, to measure what we call the realness, but measure the authenticity and, and the nefariousness of the actors. Remember, we don't do fact checks, right? We as a company, we took a step back from fact checking because to go back to what we said at the beginning, is that I don't know if Ben's background is purple or pink or, or gray or like light blue. I don't. If I don't know as a human being, it means that it's going to be extremely difficult for a machine to provide an answer that will be satisfying for more than 50% of the population. Therefore, we took a step back in fact-checking. So we don't do the fact-check, but we, we did do for, for Musk and the Twitter team, the author checking and the snowball, the spreading check, right? So the entire equation eventually revolved around why would we care if it's 11, 12, 13, 14% of spam and butter count, when in some cases you have five bucks, one micro influencer, and MSNBC journalists that together were able to influence another 8.5 million people. The ratio of inauthenticity is completely irrelevant because it's going to be 0 0.0002%. But the spread was absolutely mind boggling. So it's not always about the quantity. It's also about the quality of what you do. That's my point. And that the statistical message that we wanted to give to Musk and, and his team and eventually Twitter team hopes. Well, can you imagine those network effects? Oh. Wild. We've, we've, also, we've also seen that if you don't do the due diligence through a technology like yours, Dan, how bad it can go, right? We saw JP Morgan Chase acquire a business for just shy of 200 million. The, yeah, with the belief that there was two, uh, so, sorry, there was almost 5 million users on this social networking profile. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there was roughly 4 million of those users were actually fake users, which were found out after the acquisition. And now there's a lawsuit being engaged. You know, you know I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up because it's a, it's a, mad, it's a wild story. It's a wild mm -hmm. story. $200 million on the table as we speak, but it's a wild story because, and you know, when you think about it, you can't really blame JP Morgan. You would like to say your job was to do due diligence and you, but you'd also equally say, you would like to say to the company, your job is to be open-minded and trustful. Are you going to lie about 80% of everything you do? This is absolutely nuts, right? So it's very difficult to blame each side. But if we don't want to blame and just look at the picture, I think it happened more times. And I yeah. think we just don't know about it. Do you think uh, there's an element of unknown unknowns there though, Dan, as well, in terms of the authenticity or nefariousness of those actors from, in that case, the acquiry, where they just might not be aware of the extent of or the scale of this sort of... You mean the takeover? You mean was it the company? Tell me if I understood your question correctly. Are you asking if the company did this or did this? Is that your question? Yeah, the latter. <laughs> the oh, I didn't know. The latter. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm sure there's a bit of column A, column B, but potentially, is there an element of unknown unknowns? I mean, 
Seems like you think the contrary. Almost 200 million. I would hope that it wasn't at this. I would, yeah, I would, yeah. Exactly. I would like to hope that it's not like this. Yeah. But also, it's not 12%. Because if it was 12%, if it was instead of 5 million, it would have been, oh, you know, we, we, um, we made a mistake, a financial mistake, and then they can find a way to... We wouldn't have known about the story if it was 12%. Uh, it is 80%. 80%. By the way, there was credit. And when you look at the lawsuit, it's really interesting. 80% that was eventually credited in a very short amount of time by one, uh, by one request to a certain professor in data scientist that if I'm not mistaken, had been paid close to $20,000. So how incredible of a return that is, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. On the topic- of $160 million. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, thousand. yeah. I'd be interested to talk through a few other case case studies or examples. Dan, I did read on the cyber blogs the Netflix effect and boycott FIFA twenty three. Tell us a bit about yeah. those. Oh man, these are cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, strap in. Yeah, I've had some people in the past that were mad at me because because they're like, I don't understand why are you against this brand or that person. I'm like, I'm not against anyone. My job is actually to not be against. My job is to just simply say things. So I I pissed off a few people in the past with this. Um, we all have. And by the way, you sound like you've got Ben's job. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ben's Ben is is much more likable. That's okay. Uh, the long story I'll short is, yeah, please do. It's a compliment. Um, <laughs> there's. Uh, did you guys watch the what do we call it? Queen's Gambit? Did you watch just? Oh yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes. So, here's an interesting story. Right? Why don't we take a step back from all the negativity and think about the things that could potentially happen if we had a slightly better world and less bad people, right? The Queen's Gambit example with the Netflix effect is a huge, interesting topic. So. So we all constantly analyzing, oh my God, what is going to be the, the next snowball? And, and we do that for all purposes because we are geeks that are intrigued, but also because we know that we have customers that are asking for help. In that case, while Netflix is not a customer, we found something really interesting. We found that when you are extracting little bits and bytes of content around the, the Netflix topics and around the release of the latest season, the Queen's Gambit, you actually saw that there was a correlation and an increase in chessboard sales. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be taking 125% because of the TV show. So, right? So up until now, we were talking about the bad and fake actors and disinformation and fake news. That's a really interesting example of how if you do a good job with the ABC, with the actor, the behavior, and the content, you are able to take an industry that is, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, it's, a, it's, an, it's an old industry, but a pretty large one too, right? Uh, and just double it. Double it because of the fact that the online world, as we said earlier, is able to affect drastically the offline. That's what yeah. that's Simple. Absolutely, simple. yeah. Also, really similarly, I, the, wasn't it the Stranger Things soundtrack, the new season, Running Up That Hill? No. That, yeah, that yeah. was like, isn't that like a 1970s song? And then it's just exploded in popularity because of the Netflix effect, as you're describing, Dan. Maybe. Yeah. And there was, and I'm sure if you go and talk to, to the singers and the songwriters and the producers, I am 100% sure. And I haven't talked to it. Actually, I should, I should go and try and schedule a call with it. But I'm 100% sure that they were surprised at the amount of demand generation that it created for them as, as professionals in their industry from an, from an avenue that they didn't even think of. This is not a, it's not a Columbia Pictures $115 million budget with Steven Spielberg and CAA. This is not that. This is, this is Netflix. Like recently launched TV show, Stranger Things, boom, exploded. I love this. And now for the sad story, because I actually love playing FIFA. But FIFA, FIFA 23, okay? What? I can't see. Oh, it's in my, I've got a TV here with FIFA on at the moment. Oh, my. 
this. <laughs> Doing value. FIFA 23 Frank. with uh, with the first ever female Aussie on Sam the cover. Kerr Sammy on the Kerr. Cover. Send this yeah, over yeah, to yeah. former teammate. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> oh, Flex. really? Crazy. Very cool. Oh, wow. I mean, I know you're a superstar, but I, you know, I, it, I it just, of when the story it. unravels, it gets even better, Dan. It's, <laughs> That's All that's right. the one that's the one affecting an offline story there, Dan. Okay. <laughs> no, but uh, look, to be honest, the FIFA thing, it's interesting. So FIFA was a great example of not necessarily again to go back at the ABC actor behavior and content. Here the content was really interesting because this time uh it was around the sentiment. A lot of the authentic conversation. Every t- every time we, we, we talk to people and we're trying to sort of help them understand and educate them. There's always a flip side to inauthentic. It's called authentic. Real people expressing their opinion. And the FIFA 23 is a beautiful example of that. We've seen a very, very high ratio of real people, like the three of us, that are commenting about them being disappointed around the game. And we even went to the point where we, we were actually comparing the general sentiment of the brand of EA Sports alongside FIFA 23 versus Activision, Blazar, Nixon, whomever you want, right? And, and it, was, it was a huge gap, right? There was a massive gap of tens of percentages between how people were perceiving in a bad way just for the sake of, and real people were perceiving in a bad way, negative sentiment, the launch of FIFA 23 and what it brought to the table versus how Activision and Blizzard were, were being perceived at this, uh, that exact you know, time period. So it's sad because I love EA Sports and I love FIFA, but still my job, still my job to put the truth out there at least. It's, somebody's got to do it. And I'm glad that there is organizations like yours, Dan, that is doing uh, that work. Uh, I've got a sad story to tell too. Um, I was actually part of that 125% statistic that bought a chessboard as a result of the Queen's Gambit. Thank you for your confession, yeah. Ben. Yeah. Thank you for your service, like we did. Yeah. Thank you for your service, yeah. Was it a wood chessboard? It, it was, wood. I'm surprised it's not here somewhere. It's a wood one with glass on top. Uh, yeah, well, I had oh, to go authentic. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Now I've got my 10 year old playing it as well. So it's, it's <laughs> worked out. Hey, Dan, you mentioned uh, G, uh, Chat GPT, and it'd be remiss of me not to go back to that because I think it's, it's a topic of conversation that's front of mind for a lot of our listeners as well. One thing I just wanted to, I've been on a rabbit hole for Chat GPT over the last couple of weeks, and I don't think people quite understand what GPT is in Chat GPT. So for the listeners, it's the GPT dash number stands for the evolution in the process of behind it. GPT stands for generative pre-training transformer. And we're at the third iteration, which is chat GPT three. And the, by definition, it's essentially a, an artificial intelligence technology by open AI that allows chat bots or interactive bots to understand and generate human like uh, natural language. Um, and we've seen with chat GPT three, how accurate it can be in some instances, right? And it's fluency with understanding human language. We're still not there with some of the nuances with human uh, and NLP and those types. But at the moment, we're about to transition to GPT-4, which more than amp- it amplifies the processing power of GPT-3 by about 700%, which will be absolutely wild. Now, my question to you is in the field of work that you do, do you see GPT or chat GPT, as people understand it, as a weapon of mass disruption or perhaps even a precursor to a, uh, a mass disruption technique, noting how much credible information we can generate at scale. Oh. Ben, thank you for, oh, you. Right. Thank you for your TED talk. Yeah, that was great, right. Ben. No, 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 this is beautiful. <laughs> this is beautiful and you know your beep. <laughs> okay. um, by the way, did you know that Microsoft Yes. They invested a billion in chat G- in, in open AI and now they're looking to acquire forty nine percent. That's A. B. I don't I don't know if people know, but the former president of Y Combinator, Sam Altman. Yeah. And Elon Musk and Reed Hoffman. 
which is the founder of LinkedIn. Yeah. They are among the few co-founders of OpenAI. Just yeah, there you go. It's all connected. ABC yeah, yeah. as well. That's a different form of ABC, ABC <laughs> for Dan. Yeah, we'll always no, be closing. No. One, so. All right. So <laughs> to go back to your question, Ben, um, look, when social media platforms are created, and I still think it's the case today, I genuinely think, and look from where I'm speaking, from my Sayabraha, I actually genuinely think that they were in from a nefarious perspective. Agreed. They were not. What was the goal of Facebook or Meta? It was to connect college friends that you haven't seen or talked to in 2002, 3, 4. And then it just ramped up from one college to another. And then Harvard. You know the rest, right? And so just expect it to expand it. What was the goal of LinkedIn when we speak professionally for a second? The goal of LinkedIn is to become the professional social platform, right? And, and of course, we've got a lot of conversations about it where people are saying, oh, but LinkedIn became so political and so like commercially driven almost. It hasn't, it didn't stay a platform of true professional conversations. It turned into a mess, you know, dollar generating machine. I get it. I'm not saying yes. I'm not saying no. But to go back to your question, and I think you understand where I'm headed. These platforms were not built from a bad point, right? They were built with a really, really good intention. And I still think it's the case. But I think that 20 years later, almost 20 years later, right? I think that other people, the so-called, you know, bad and fake actors out there, they found a breach and that breach became an uncurable pin. That's my point. Now, the, the interesting question for me, for you, for the listeners, for the industry is if Chad GP, if OpenAI as a company has the power to become another major vector in this whole online world, the question is, can we put fences and, and, and roadblocks and mechanisms today before it becomes what the social platforms are in 20 years? And by the way, it won't be 20 years. For them, it's going to be four years, mm. four or five. So they have less time because their growth is absolutely mad exponential. So unless they do something about it right now and they... And it's not, you know, putting bandages. It, it, it's doing something about it. Because if you look at the infrastructure of the social platforms today, the odds of changing the way that the social platforms are working today, when you have one, two, three, four billion end users, is from a technological standpoint, you ask your fellow colleagues, it's impossible. Let's throw a few stat, stats out on the exponential growth of ChatGPT. I just want to call this out. The time it took to reach 1 million users for Netflix was three and a half years. For Airbnb, it was two and a half. For Facebook, it was 10 months. For Spotify, it was five months. For the iPhone, it was 74 days. It took wow. ChatGPT to reach 1 million users five days total. Wow. Yeah. Hectic. Hectic. Again, I'm one of those stats. That's why I'm saying I don't think I don't think they have 20 years. <laughs> yeah. On their own and think and brainstorm with people. I think they have a bunch of years to realize that they they can either do something about it today, or they can just become bypassers and let the machine decide what is going to be its fate. Yeah, those, guard, those guardrails will be critical for technologies like. Chat GPT and and the future iterations to come. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion in the community, particularly in cyber, about could Chat Chat GPT be used for harm as as a new threat? What's the risk? And probably hotly contested as well, but certainly poses a lot in my opinion. Such as using Chat GPT to create malicious code at scale. That's a very prominent feature in Chat GPT. You can build new narratives and content for things like disinformation. You know, there's like a whole bunch of things, content for phishing, you know, it can be used, but then I'm sure even just 
on a more of a deeper nefarious side, you know, just actually serving up content and information that is not correct or could be just, you know, charged with something that is a bit more nefarious. Like there are dangers associated with it. And I do agree that the guide rails would be critical. Just as we know in cybersecurity in particular, it's about technology provides such wonderful opportunities for the advancement of humanity. But at the same time, hack is hack. People are bad people are going to do bad things. So equally, they look to leverage those new technologies for bad purposes, unfortunately. Agree. You can almost bet on that like uh, Ben has his kimchi and scrambled eggs every morning. That's a, that's a given. <laughs> kimchi and scrambled eggs. You mix it in, Ben? No, you can't mix it in or it kills the good probiotics. But um, yeah. You're so wow. cultured. We're another, another podcast we can talk <laughs> that's about. That's how it looks like so Oh, you haven't seen, but you'd be on my Zoom box, Dan. It's a, it's a mess down there. It's the new beard cut. I think that's why you look so fantastic, Ben. I'm sweating with all these compliments, guys. This is my favorite episode so far. <laughs> Just play it on loop. Yeah. Oh, too good. Then the, oh, I found really impressive about the technology at Cyabra, being able to monitor and analyze like billions of interactions in real time. And we talk, we spoke about before the authenticity and, and of course, stopping the spread of misinformation. When you're engaging in client conversations and given the prominence of how important this is today, well, what do you, what is your message to business leaders about the importance of this capability on the good side and, and also therefore the impacts of disinformation to consumers, potentially their own customers? Right. <clears throat> so be you know, this is actually a really good point. You're adding your question with, with an incredible point. It's, of course, the C in the equation, the consumers, the simple people like you and me are obviously being affected. But for the sake of, of discussing for a second about Sabra, we are a B2B company, right? So we serve the larger companies and the larger enterprises. And so when, when, we, when we go out there and, and, and discuss and serve the CISOs and the CIOs, and even in some cases, you'd be surprised. Even the CMOs, it does make sense, but but it's still a threat. Um, uh, obviously, for the CISOs and the CIOs, it really revolves around a couple of use cases that they should be worrying about. A, they worry about whatever threat Sabre is able to uncover from the open source nefarious world around affecting my bottom line, especially right now. We, you know throughout this whole crazy economic meltdown, if, you, if there is a company that can point me to the direction of either saving costs and making more money, this is the holy grail of a, of a software as a service, right? So this is really what people are looking, even when you talk to the CISOs and the CIOs. So I think this is one of the most important things is, you know, is Sayabra or any other vendor, is Sayabra able to point out to the direction of, lowering my risk of losing money or increasing my opportunity of gaining money because I've right so so losing the risk would be the CISOs and the CIOs while increasing revenue might be more for the CMOs, right? I guess it, it makes sense from that perspective. The other thing that is really important for, for them, for the CISOs and CIOs, it's the brand protection. It's the which is obviously tied to the risk intelligence. But now, more and more, we see a shift where these so-called CISOs and CIOs are, in fact, being responsible for the brand protection and the digital risk protection, per, per se, because they are the said they, They've taken 5, 10, 50 years to build a reputation around a major brand, launching 25 new products worldwide, and even the reputation and the brand name of the executives. And if you can simply go and impersonate yourself as one of the board members of the executives, and then you can go out there and spread rumors and lies. This is bad. This is really bad. And this is really bad for the CISOs. Maybe at some point for the mitigation, maybe the communications folks will be involved, right? To sort of try and balance it out and understand what's the narrative to, to bring out there to the world. But the CISOs will be the one pushing the buttons at the beginning and, and sort of analyze it because it is digital risk protection at the highest level. It's you yeah. and the brand yours, and then you can destroy it within five tweets 
and the rumor at a hundred bucks. I mean, come on, this is crazy. Just like you said before, Dan, on the negative sentiment can destroy reputation and brands and the FIFA 23 release. I mean, I'm sure you went knocking on EA's door there, but the negative sentiment can be really drastically detrimental to companies and brands, individuals alike. And it does spread like wildfire on the internet today. And actually, and that was my, actually my last example, sorry to interrupt you, but my last example is actually related to competitive intelligence. It's so easy. (laughs) Really? It really is easy, right? If you could potentially go out there, play if you're really looking and reading between the lines, that there is always going to be a head-to-head online information warfare between companies, of course, between government and between political parties. That's not even surprising anyone in this conversation. That's, that's easy. But between companies? Think about it. Why would it be? If you have, if you have the means to finance an information warfare war against your competitor that is unlikely to be seen and discovered by the other side, then let me put my black hat for a second and say, why wouldn't you? Is it a that's software? A massive use case that we've seen. Massive for the enterprise. So that's yeah. a big thing. This wasn't the CIOs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Is that a service you offer, Dan, at Cybra? Is scaling the internet for competitive intel misinformation warfare? Because that would be the... very interesting to see. Yeah, no, we... so so. The, the use case that I've given you are the use case that we sort of uncover, filter, and sort of bring the risk intel about so that people can mitigate against I'm not giving you any use cases that I don't know of. Uh, I'm not talking to you about, <clears throat> you know, hacking emails and endpoints and, and, you know, hacking, breaching Wi-Fi ports. This is not what we do. Even phishing is not a thing that we that we focus on as a company because... Our machine learning revolves around finding inauthenticity in the actor and then understanding the spread. If you mm-hmm. combine the two, these are the use cases important for us. It's a, it's a concept that the whole misinformation, the whole weapons of mass disruption, all of this is scary as a parent. And as a, as a father of two fellow dragons, Dan, I'm interested in, in your no, probably advice as well at the end, but what, what's your outlook for what it looks like in the future of this space as well uh, when it relates to, to the next generation? I mean, look, I can only relate to my baby dragons are 14 days old and two years old. So it's difficult for me to say that as a parent, I can try and give you my humble perspective as a person who works in the field. Um, you know, I was just talking about this actually with my, with my cousin. Uh, and he was saying, you know, my son, my daughter is seven years old. Soon she's going to be wanting to have a smartphone. And, and if I say no, no, you're smiling because you may have had that conversation. So, so, he, so he says, if I say no, <clears throat> within the next few weeks, I'm going to receive a phone call from a teacher saying that because of the fact that my daughter, uh, your daughter, sorry, doesn't have a smartphone. She's, she's being excluded slowly from the current status quo, which is the seven and the eight and the 10 years old have a smartphone. And they train uh, in their breaks. They train doing TikTok dances and uploading weird Instagram pictures. And, and I don't know what, and liking food pictures. Um, it's just my Saturday it. night, Dan. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Think about it. This is. This is, this is weird. So he's, so he tells me, I don't know what to do. If I say no, I am not doing a favor to my daughter from a social standpoint. If I say yes, I am not doing a favor to my daughter as, as a father that is worried about the upcoming years and proliferation of social media weird outcomes. So I told him the thing that I would have said to my baby dragons if they were at that age, which is. And it's, it's so, I'm sorry, it's soft. It's almost fluffy, but just talk, explain to them. Just explain to them. When I was a young boy, uh, the internet just came out. 
my parents, they sat me down and they said, the internet is great. You can play with your friends on Counter-Strike, because I'm a geek. Play with your friends Counter-Strike. You can go and browse for their latest articles around cars, because I love cars. Uh, but you need to be careful. And that's something that they did because they understood you can't fight it. They weren't able to fight it. I was already like 11, 12 years old. The internet just came out in France. And it was like, you either fight it and you make your child unsocial or you, or you help your child sort of stand out and not being exposed as much as you can to the threats. That's what I would do as a parent. That's what I told my cousin. I don't see her. Maybe there will be solutions, tech solutions that can help you sort of monitor and sort of, you know, de-riskify and mitigate their own usage. Uh, but, but what? It's going to be on your daughter's smartphone? What if she takes the smartphone of her friend and there's no mitigation there? Yeah, like you said at the start, Dan, when you spoke and opened up eloquently around the ideological and the technological sort of intersection as it pertains to this sort of stuff. Were you clapping then, Ben Wei? Is it? I, in my head, <laughs> I was clapping, yeah. <laughs> I think very much potentially maybe in the future we see Sarabra scale out into something more that can equip young minds to understand oh. and think critically. Watch this space, hey? This is my dream come true, honestly. If we'd have the time and the means to do it, I would absolutely love to scale our solution to the sea. To the consumer. This yeah. is, is an all dream come true. Great. Well, stay tuned. We'll be supporting you on the sidelines. <laughs> I would like to be part of the statistic that buys that first off as well. <laughs> <laughs> you will be my first million doctors. <laughs> yeah, love that. <laughs> Dan, where can people find you? They'll be listening in to this dark mode episode. It's been super insightful. But if people wanted to connect with yourself or Sayabra or learn more about the offerings, where could they start? Where could they find you? Uh, we're super active on LinkedIn because we've been trying to act as the, as the Batman of, of like trustworthy conversations. So we just released like a ton of content, uh, either on LinkedIn or part of our blog. Uh, I think that's also, you know, about the Netflix effect. Uh, and if they want to reach out directly, just dan.sabra.com. Available. Even if I don't answer immediately it's because I'm not sleeping. Because I'm not <laughs> yeah. Great. And. Can attest to the blogs being fantastic. So we will also link those in the show notes and looking forward to releasing this to the community, Dan. I know this is going to be a very hot topic of keen interest. So thanks so much for joining us today on Dark Mode. I was thrilled. Thank you so much, Dan. Thanks, Dan.